Be here now. Just be here now. So grief isn't good or bad. No emotion is good or bad. All emotion has a healing message. But one has to be with it. One has to be touched by it in order to receive the message. Welcome to Healing at the Edge, a podcast of interviews, archive talks, and teachings on conscious living, conscious dying with Ramdev Dale Borglum, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Dale has been a meditation teacher for nearly 50 years and has been at the bedside of the dying and their loved ones for over 40 years. He was the director of the Hanuman Foundation and founded the first center for conscious dying in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He's taught with Stephen Levine, Ram Dass, and countless others along the spiritual path. Dale is still working with the dying today. For more information, please visit livingdying.org. Hello, my name is Aurora Leonard, and I am the Associate Director of the Living Dying Project. And in today's episode, I think it contains or it may contain some relevant content for anyone who is undergoing a practice. Um, So there are some common storylines we hear from clients who are approaching end of life and some of these beliefs or these thoughts are along the lines of my spiritual life has been a failure. You've probably heard Dale talk about this in his recent episodes, and you don't have to be dealing with an end of life issue to think these thoughts. Uh, But, you know, it goes along the lines of something like, I am so inadequate. I am not doing this right. I'm not meditating or chanting in a way that makes the angels reveal themselves. I'm not passing the test as if we're taking a test in life and there's a big pass or fail. Um, It's the belief or the feeling of being a disappointment and being frustrated. Well, this is something that is common, I do want to say. So for anyone listening, please know that there are other folks who are dealing with this as well. And also to say that We have a treat for this kind of spiritual existential funk today because Ramdev is going to talk about just this. But before we hear from him, I want to make a short announcement and say that for any licensed professional who may be listening, Ramdev will be teaching a three-hour CEU online workshop called Heart of the Matter on Friday, July 22nd, 2022. And you can register on our website at livingdying.org. You don't have to be a licensed professional to take the workshop, although I would recommend then to just sign up for the online workshop called Healing at the Edge. It includes eight hours of content plus more practices, but if you don't have the time to do that and three hours works for your schedule right now, then by all means, please sign up for the Heart of the Matter workshop. We would love to see you there. So thank you. And now on to the episode. What we're going to be talking about today is a bit of a continuation of the last couple of groups where uh, two weeks ago, two two meetings ago, sorry, I talked about a couple of clients I'd had, one who had done very little spiritual practice and one who had done really a lot. And before they died, they both said, my spiritual life has been a failure. They felt that they were supposed to get something, that there was something, some mark of progress. And I I stumbled upon, right at that point, a, a, a poem by Rumi. And in the poem, there's somebody who's kind of complaining that his prayers were never answered. He never heard anything back from God. And God, in the poem, responds, the longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Mm. The longing you express is the return message. So that rather than thinking, if I work hard enough, I'm going to get something, 
that there is always inherent in the moment this notion of presence or grace or a more Buddhist concept of emptiness, that it's always available. It's always there. And yes, it's nice. Sometimes God shows up and pats you on the shoulder and said, oh, you're a good little meditator. Here, let me give you some bliss for the next little while. But very often that doesn't happen. And really, it's much more about realizing that in the immediacy of what we're experiencing, that that sense of grace or emptiness is already here. And then two weeks ago, we talked about receiving this grace. And we talked about it from a fairly uh, Christian Hindu devotional standpoint. And I read the following poem by St. John of the Cross, a wonderful Christian mystic from Spain, where he said, what is grace, I asked God, and he said, all that happens. Then he added, when I looked perplexed, could not lovers say that every moment in their beloved's arms was grace? Existence is my arms. Once again, existence is my arms, says God, though I well understand how one can turn away from me until the heart has wisdom. Rumi is saying essentially the same thing that that, uh, St. John of the Cross is saying here, that it's all grace. Ramdas had this horrible, wonderful quote, suffering is grace. Today, the title of the talk is Grace, Gratitude, and Grief. (laughs) I tried to make it as alliterative as possible, and there I succeeded. Okay, Grace, Gratitude, and Grief. And we're going to talk about this, at least partly from a much more Buddhist standpoint of grace. I know that Buddhists don't usually use that word exactly, but I think that the notion is firmly embedded in the Buddhist worldview. But before we dive into Buddhism, I've been reading a book by Father Gregory Boyle, who wrote Tattoos of the Heart, one of my all-time favorite books. His new book is called The Whole Language. He's the, the Catholic priest in East L.A. who founded Homeboy Industries and works with ex-convicts and gang members and gets them into productive employment, removes tattoos, uh, helps them out in all kinds of ways. And he keeps making the point in this book that the work he's doing is not making somebody into a better person that God doesn't see there's any way for any of us to be better, that who we are right now, who we are right now is filled with grace already. One of the homies came to Father Greg and said, please make me a better man. And he said, I can't make you a better man. You're magnificent and perfect as you are, even though the person he was talking to had been incarcerated and done a lot of horrible things. But as long as we're pursuing spiritual practice as an endeavor in a grand self-improvement project, that I'm working with my inadequacy so I can feel inadequate and be worthy of God's love and get over my original sin, then we're really working with this whole thing from a, a profound and very unfortunate misunderstanding that can we be practicing from more this sense that Rumi and and St. John of the Cross and Greg Boyle is talking about, that our decision is firm, we're searching for purity in each other in each moment. It's there. It's so easy to search for what we want to criticize in others and certainly in ourselves. And is it possible instead that to have this mystical kind of love. It's working with peace rather than being on the lookout to criticize. Thich Nhat Hanh talks about original wound rather than original sin. As you know, I run the Living Dying Project. I'm often working with people who are dying, people who are grieving. Just in this last week, some really incredible stories of suffering come to me. A lot of the work that I talk about with people is Transforming grief from an unconscious process to a conscious process. Making grief conscious. And in my experience, both 
in myself and with the people I'm working with. Grief is often what is preventing us from appreciating the grace, the presence, the emptiness in the moment. Grief are the negative emotions that are arising in response to you and I feeling separate. Stereotypically, we think of grief as I'm sad because somebody left, somebody died. But beyond that, grief is any emotion that arises out of feeling separate. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, you get angry. That's a grief reaction. You look at what's going on with the Supreme Court or in Ukraine or with your next door neighbor and you get frustrated, anxious, uh, upset. That's a grief reaction because you're feeling separate from those beings, from yourself, from God. Rumi, going back to our dear friend Rumi, has this wonderful quote, grief is the garden of compassion. Compassion Gratitude, the heart qualities, are about being connected. We connect through the heart. We connect to ourselves. We connect to each other. We connect to our beloved with a small b or with a capital B. And grief, on the other hand, is feeling separate. One part of working with grace, cultivating grace, is beginning to make grief conscious and transforming unconscious grief into a heart experience. Uh, grief being the garden of compassion. What's a garden? It's a place where something nutritious or beautiful grows. Can something beautiful grow out of our original wound? Out of that place where I feel separate from myself at times, where you feel separate from you or others or from, from God. The, the, the point or the horizontal or the vertical, if I'm going to be mathematical or geometrical about it. So grace is not a thing, not something we receive from God, but more the attitude and openness where we can trust emptiness in each moment. We can trust that there is presence in each moment. And some moments are very difficult because, I mean, I'm, I'm going to see a woman I was supposed to see her today, but because of the COVID restrictions in the hospital, her family's coming today. She's at UCSF, and she is an open sore that's her whole back. Her whole back is bleeding, and it's invaded her body to the extent that uh, her spine has been affected, and she's been paralyzed from the waist down. She's a very young woman. The doctors don't have much to offer her anymore. Can she work with that experience as grace? Obviously not so easy. I would even suggest, though, that at times, going beyond the really wonderful experiences and the really difficult experiences, that the neutral experiences are often the hardest ones in which to understand there is grace inherent. You're just walking to your car, you're sitting in a chair, you're not doing much. Life isn't very good or very bad, it's just trundling along. We go to sleep so much. We're living in that kind of slight sleep state where we're not resting in the, in the presence of, of grace and presence. So Christianity doesn't talk too much about how to do this other than faith in God. And Maharaji, of course, said the only thing that's important is how much you love God. There's really two ways of dealing with this. One is deep in your faith, deep in your love for God. But the other is begin to work with what blocks our love, what blocks our appreciation of grace, our receiving of grace, our cultivating of grace. So I'd like to talk just briefly about how Buddhism has a very clear way, a very clear path to moving from unconscious grief to open-hearted gratitude and compassion and finally, to direct experience of grace in a more tantric sense itself. In, in Buddhism, there are what are called the three turnings of the wheel, which are Theravada or Hinayana Buddhism, which is basically mindfulness practice. Then there's Mahayana Buddhism, which is Zen and Chan, which brings in compassion in the heart. And finally, Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhism, which brings in the notion of tantric empowerment, of realizing that the deity is present, she, he is always present, 
that that right now in this moment you are Buddha, you are Red Tara, you are Christ, you are whoever it is that is the one that is your beloved in this particular moment. Each of these each of these turnings of the wheel is a practice in itself. In the first one, in Theravada Buddhism or Hinayana Buddhism, it's really basically having faith in the triple gem and the four noble truths. I'm sure almost everybody here knows what those things are, but it's basically trusting that all you have to do is practice mindfulness. The four noble truths, for instance, are there is unsatisfactoriness or suffering or dukkha in life. It's caused by grasping, let go of grasping, no more suffering. And here's the way to do it, the Eightfold Noble Path. Can we begin to slow down enough to begin to be present enough that we can begin to be mindful of the way suffering's arising? I, I didn't get a very good night's sleep last night. I woke up really early and I thought I should meditate so I could be a more clear speaker for my beloved friends here. And I was sitting there today and I was kind of tired. I actually had this fantastic meditation uh, because I didn't have much energy. And I was just noticing how there was a very subtle grasping at emptiness, how there was part of me that wanted to just be with sensation or mantra. And every time a thought would arise, right, hear the sound of the traffic, that I, I just very subtly pulled away from that and tried to go back to something that I thought was better to be with. And I saw how there was just such a subtle sense of suffering that even though I have the ability to quiet my mind usually pretty quickly, that there was still a part of me that's trying to get away from just being who I was, that it's okay to think, that it's okay to hear sounds that are going on in the room rather than be with the, the designated object of meditation. That right now sitting there, maybe you're kind of tired or you're kind of anxious or you're kind of agitated. That's grace. That's can we can we realize then that mindfulness itself just being with whatever is is healing, is an expression of grace. Each of these turnings of the wheel has a vow that's taken, a commitment that one makes as a way of deepening practice. And the, the vow here in this first level of practice of Buddhism is to really pay enough attention, slow things down enough that you can see the fundamental nature of reality, how, how suffering arises, how you can see the groundlessness, making friends with your fundamental nature. And there's a difference between saying, I'd really like to do that and taking a vow. And I would encourage people if you like to have a piece of homework here, to take a vow this week or maybe till we see each other next, the next couple of weeks, to, to, to take a vow to let go of some way that you have traditionally, historically, of running away from being present. Uh, in my Monday night group that Nancy was in for a long time, we, we took this vow a long time ago, and a bunch of people, including myself, took the vow to stop judging other people and ourselves. Uh, somebody else took the vow to stop watching pornography. Apparently, for him, the vow lasted about two days. And the point here is not that the vow is going to be perfectly successful, but that just by taking the vow itself, you'll begin to have, you'll begin to notice more immediately without a sense of guilt, without repression. We're not talking about repressing here. We're talking about sharpening focus, sharpening the motivation to go beyond conditioned behavior, to be lost in unconscious grief. So that, that you take this vow to let go of this, this habitual way of going to sleep. Maybe, I mean, I let my Netflix expire on purpose. It's been a great boon to my practice, I assure you. And uh, maybe letting go of judging, taking a vow not to do something is a lot more power than just trying not to do that thing. Maybe it's comfort eating. Maybe it's bad speech gossiping as a way of escaping. Or maybe it's going to the computer as soon as there's some empty moment in your life. So why don't you just think about that for a minute or two now? 
And maybe not the thing that the mind immediately jumps to, but ask, ask yourself, what's, what are you ready to really work with? What are you ready to let go of, be on some edge? I mean, most of my groups are called Healing at the Edge, which has the lovely acronym H-A-T-E, unfortunately. But at the same time, there is this edge we're all living at, right? Where until you go beyond the edge, you don't know what the edge is. As long as we're comfortably ensconced on the safe side of the edge, we're never going to know what the edge really is. So we have to push ourselves occasionally. Making a relationship with what you're trying to get away from. The notion is that if we're persistent in this kind of practice and we begin to go through the fear of groundlessness, of emptiness, of just being present, that we'll begin to find that basic, unshakable human goodness that Father Greg was talking about, that Rumi was talking about, that, that St. John of the Cross was talking about. The longing you express is the return message. Existence is my arm, says God. The very existence itself. So that going beyond this tension that's always there between the groundless, empty nature of reality and the ego's desire to reify itself and be something that's solid, that doesn't really, in fact, exist, right? There's always this tension going on. It's very uncomfortable. Acknowledging when we're running away from the feeling of being present, of living without fixation. So the second turning of the wheel is when Buddhism brought in the notion of compassion, that once we really stop running away from what's causing us to suffer, compassion begins to arise. We begin to feel grateful for what it is we're experiencing. We can begin to experience that suffering itself is something we can be grateful for because we want to be free. It's showing us where we want or need to do the next piece of work. And in this next level of practice, people take the bodhisattva vow. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. It's a pretty big vow. I vow to save all beings from suffering. Desires are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. The dharmas are boundless. I vow to attain them. The Buddhist way is unsurpassable. I vow to attain it. I slightly mixed up the third one there, but you, you, you get the notion. Those are vows that aren't going to happen fully today, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to save all sentient beings. I'm not going to end all desire. I'm not going to master all the dharmas. But taking that vow to really understand the metaphor that I'm on a sinking ship and that I'm going to be the last one off. I'm willing to die so that everybody else can get off of the boat. Right? If, if I can help you get off the boat, then I'll, I'll stay there so that you can take the last seat on the lifeboat. And in doing that, we're beginning to really directly cut through in a very, in a, in a, a very direct way, a clinging to the self that's causing suffering in the first place by being willing to have compassion for other people's suffering, by wanting to end suffering for all sentient beings, we're alleviating our own suffering. The Dalai Lama has this great quote. He says, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. One of the things I do that makes me most happy, other than being with some of my dearest friends, is sitting down and feeling compassion for this long prayer list I have of people. Just saying a person's name, going to my heart, saying the next person's name. And at the end of that, I feel so empty of myself and full of love and compassion. But it's, it's a willingness to feel other people's suffering rather than protect myself, rather than buy into the original wound that Thich Nhat Hanh was talking about. Tonglen is a wonderful practice for deepening this particular part of the path of being willing to do Tonglen for, say, all the people in New Mexico whose homes are threatened or all the people in 
Ukraine whose homes are threatened or taken away or whose relatives have died, or maybe just your next door neighbor or maybe part of yourself. The Bodhisattva vow vowing to help other beings. And finally, when the heart opens enough, the third way of developing practice is the tantric Vajrayana Tibetan practice. Uh, and they take something called the Samaya vow, which is we're really directly asking about what is the nature of reality? And the understanding is that the nature of reality is pure energy, that it's all consciousness, it's all the beloved, that everybody here is uh, the Devi, everybody here is the Buddha, everybody here is the Christ, the mother, whatever form that takes for you. Now we're finally then existing in grace. So we've gone from unconscious grief to conscious grief made conscious through mindfulness, the heart opens and we, we begin to feel gratitude for everything, including the loss, the grief, the separation. We're, we're, we're transmuting separation into connectedness. And as the heart opens further into boundlessness, which is its true nature, the empty nature of the heart reveals the nature of things. So that we're not even so much interested in our relationship with stuff. But what is the nature of things? And, and that's kind of what happened in my meditation this morning, that I was, first of all, aware of how I was grasping at emptiness. And then I felt this loving relationship with even that part of myself. But then finally, I got the fact that, that thinking and distraction is just as much wisdom and emptiness as the space between thoughts, that there's nothing that can separate me from this unshakable truth that reality is has the nature of emptiness that each moment is my uh surrender into this oneness this, this sacred reality that it's it's not dependent on the content it's not even dependent on my relationship with the content it's the nature of content itself is whole no matter how uh, how difficult or boring or wonderful the story happens to be. Somebody falls in love, gets all excited. Somebody's got an open sore in their back that's bleeding and they become paralyzed. Somebody's bored because they don't have much to do on a Saturday afternoon. All of those has the nature, the same nature of wholeness, of, of full expression of grace. So whether you want to take more the path of deepening faith, loving God more, realizing that everything is grace, or whether you want to work with what are the obstacles in a more Buddhist way and take these vows, maybe start with the first one, do that for a lifetime or two, then move on to the second one of helping all other beings. That's kind of up to you and me. I've been thinking a lot lately about the Divine Mother, and I'd like to read you some names of the Divine Mother from a couple of hymns that I found, just as a way of giving the sort of a, a more global understanding of what it is that can be worshipped. Existence, giver of wisdom, who art all action, accessible by devotion, Reality, knowledge, destructoress of distress, destroyer of fear, in the form of desire, whose mercy is without limit. Thou art the cause of the world-destroying energy of Shiva, liberator from the bonds of karma the protector of the bridge of Dharma, blazing like a million suns, who is the death of death, holder of the spear, whose substance is all mantras, terrifying, whose love is unbounded. So the mother is terrifying, her love is unbounded. She's full of mercy. She also destroys. 
She also protects. Can we love that expansive version of sacred reality? Hi, Dale. It's Carly. Yeah, hi, Carly. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask if we could return back to uh, grief. Um, yeah, sure. And because I get a little tangled uh, when we start discussing that grief is um, sort of a separation from the other, it's like an individualist place to be. And I and I don't know if I'm doing this myself, but I feel like I'm taking it to a place of judgment and criticism that feeling grief is somehow bad. And I know I'm oversimplifying that um, because I feel like feeling and experiencing grief is, uh, invaluable. It's really important. And I feel like, you know, the nature of being human is to avoid the feeling of grief because it's complicated, you know? And so I'm, I'm getting tangled in what I'm hearing from you because I'm perceiving it as a somehow negative, um, perception of reality or feeling. Can you talk a little bit more about, about that? Yeah. Thanks for that. That's really important because I was not at all trying to give that impression. And I'm trying to distinguish between unconscious grief, being lost in grief, and conscious grief. If grief arises or if any emotion arises or if any negative emotion arises, there's basically three ways to deal with it. Push it away, get lost in it, or be have an embodied mindfulness of what it is that's going on in the moment. There are Stereotypically, uh, you maybe heard stories about older widowers who their wife dies and a month later, two months later, they get married to somebody. They just can't be alone. Instead of feeling grief, they jump into the next relationship. They're pushing grief away. I don't want to feel the grief. I'm just going to go on and get involved in something to keep my mind and my life busy. Second example, somebody getting lost in grief. They're, they're lost in the emotion. They become the emotion. There's a very small window frame around that chunk of sky that they're viewing when they're grieving. So like, for instance, uh, the example I've used before in terms of language is in English, we say, I am afraid. In Spanish, it translates, I have fear. In Tibetan, fear is here. So that like, one would say, I am grief. I'm, I, I become the grief. I'm lost in the grief. And when you're lost in an emotion, whether it's grief or anything else, there's no movement. So grief isn't good or bad. No emotion is good or bad. All emotion has a healing message, but one has to be with it. One has to be touched by it in order to receive the message. So what I'm saying is not, not that grief is bad, but grief tends to be difficult for many people. It's easier to get lost in grief than possibly some other emotions because of the very nature that, particularly when we're talking about deep grief, that somebody's died, somebody we love is not there anymore. I'm certainly not saying that, that healthy grief isn't a healing process. And at the same time, even though I'm dividing these up into three kinds of pushing away, getting lost in under conscious grief, it's a lot more complex than that. It's always changing. There's probably parts of all three going on again and again. But the, the point is that for every time you get lost in the grief, for every time you push it away, can you come back to some embodiment of what does it feel like to be me right now when I'm experiencing grief? What does it feel like in my heart? What does it feel like in my belly? What does it feel like in my face? What does it feel like in my genitals when I'm grieving? Right? rather than just grief is bad or grief is good. Rumi's saying grief is the gateway to compassion. What I'm saying here is that unconscious grief is what, for most of us, blocks the path to the open heart. We're pushing it away. We're lost in it. We're not willing to feel our finite humanness, the brokenness of our hearts. And in feeling that brokenness, then the heart opens, then the light shines through. And we feel grateful for even this. We feel grateful for the brokenness. That's helpful, Dale. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like, um, 
you know, the reason why I bring it up is there's mass grief and, you know, individual grief. And I, I feel like humans in general and maybe Westerners specifically are in a state of grief with everything that is going on. And if we don't process it in a healthy way, it can become troublesome. I'm just trying to figure out ways to communicate with those that I care about as far as processing their grief, you know, um, and it may not be the loss of a family member or the loss of, you know, some ability to do something in themselves, but just a general state of grief of the loss or other people's grief that you're experiencing. So, um, so I guess what you're saying is, is ultimately making grief conscious and being present with grief and sitting with it is helpful. So you started off by saying all people are lost in grief. What was that first statement you just made? Just that um, I feel I feel like after coming through the pandemic and if you're at all tuned into the news, um, you know, I think that there's a tone of grief for everyone right now. I and don't for, agree. I don't you agree. don't agree? No. OK, well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to stick with it. Just because I, I just feel like if we can't, I, I feel like it's coming out in anxiety and fear and anger. And I feel like the ultimate, the ultimate tone is that there's a general grief for humans right now. And uh, I think a lot of people have trouble sitting with grief specifically, and they turn it into whatever is the easiest emotion for them, whether it's fear or anger or aggression towards another and if we could just experience that we're hurting and humans are hurting right now and love each other in that hurting space. Okay. Well, if we took a vote, I'd probably lose, but uh, apparently you and John are on one team. I would, I would say that the human condition always has been the pre pandemic and during pandemic, and there was such a thing as post pandemic that it is human nature to have grief. And that right now it's been revealed by the pandemic. And for certain people that have lost loved ones, maybe it's amplified right now. But I certainly feel that there are people who are using the pandemic, and I've talked to many of them, and I think I myself am one of them, who are grieving a lot less now than I was at the beginning of the pandemic that the pandemic has forced me to plunge into my heart and become vulnerable and open in ways that I wasn't before. What I was wanting to argue with is, is to just assume that everybody is lost in grief and that they keep your eyes out for people that aren't and stay close to them if you can, right? <laughs> that, yeah, it's the human condition that until you're enlightened, there is this sense of separation and that, that causes suffering and we can call that grief. But I think we're talking about a more psychological level of grief here in your question and that there's people who aren't really lost in that psychological grief right now. When we were with Maharaji, there was a war going on with Pakistan. There were planes flying overhead. We weren't grieving. There were people starving to death 100 miles away from where we were sitting at certain times. And we were aware of that, and yet there was there was this enlightened being within arm's reach, and it was it was a it was not filled with grief. It was filled with joy and and love and a realization that there are people suffering in the world for sure. And I, you know, I'm not saying that one can't be joyful and gracious and experiencing grace and not be grieving. I, I think that, um, and I'm not saying that absolutely everyone is in a state of grief. I feel like, um, fortunately and unfortunately, in the Bay Area specifically, we live in a bit of a bubble. We have spiritually evolved people at, you know, an arm's length if we choose. And so it's quick for us to see, oh, no, there are people that aren't experiencing grief. Yes, I feel like that's totally true. Yeah, I feel like, you know, generally speaking, due to what's going on in Ukraine to, you know, abortion rights or what's going on with family disillusion as a result of the pandemic, that I think that there's a lot of grief and it's inexperienced. You know, we don't, we don't have, humans don't have the encouragement and the guidance 
to process grief as well as some of us may in this circle and in this conversation with you and you and your world. I right? completely agree. I completely agree. And Ukraine and the Supreme Court and the pandemic is only revealing the grief that was there before the Supreme Court and the Ukraine and the pandemic. It's just revealing something that's there. It's human nature. It's always been there. It's always going to be there until somebody is free. And, mm-hmm. and, and we can talk about it from a psychological level or a mystical level. And mm-hmm. I'm trying to bring it to the mystical level that we can be free of that in the midst of it. We can be the lotus floating on the water. You're in the world, but you're not of it. I would also say that the people all around the world, that there are very awake people all over the place. And I think that there may be fewer of them here in the Bay Area than we like to think. <laughs> people are kind of caught in their awakeness in a certain very disturbing way. Moving on. Okay. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. My sense is that the people in this room have been given a gift of having the Dharma in their lives and and being a, a compassion warrior. Can we take these gifts and bring them into daily activity? Can we can we love? Can we have compassion in the face of violence and ignorance and injustice and those things? I mean, there's plenty to grieve about. There's plenty to get angry about. But can we just take the grief and the anger and use that as an inspiration to act, to be loving, strong human beings in the world? Right? I mean, it's possible to be, to be lost in grief. I know people... I taught a workshop once in Manhattan. It was like a remarkable workshop where there was literally a woman there whose husband had died three days before. There was a woman there whose son had died a week before. There was a woman there whose husband died a year ago to the day. And the guy who was grieving the most was the guy whose cat had died seven years before. He was still lost in the grief. uh, And he, he had nothing to replace the cat. He was just lost in that. And these other people were, even though the grief was very fresh, there was a sense of movement and spaciousness and working with what was going on. And it's up to us to be in that second category of seeing how we get lost in things. Take that vow to not try to escape and to be present, to to be present how we see there's suffering in the world. There's suffering in our body, locked in our body. Can we, can we be willing to be touched by that and use that as something that inspires us to be vulnerable and take a chance and, and open to what's, what's happening in our lives? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye,